Church, as we continue to worship, I'm going to invite you to take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, specifically verses 13 through 16. We're going to look at God's Word this Sunday before thousands of students and teachers and administrators and personnel head back to school across the Birmingham metro area. This Sunday before is the Sunday before uh, so much changes. Boy, what an abrupt transition it is to go from summer right into the hectic schedules of fighting the traffic and coming out and trying to figure out the best way to, to do the carpools and all those kinds of things. That's where we're headed to. We've got a few days. I wonder if we have any students here that are really excited about going to school. Can I hear you this morning? <laughs> Let me ask another question. Are there any parents here that are really excited that school starts back this week? <laughs> there we go. There we go. How, okay. So uh, I could go on with questions, but I will not. So i tell you this. One of the things about this Sunday is just a reminder to me the absolute impact that so many teachers make in the lives of students. I, I'm, I, I just thank God for teachers and administrators and directors and coaches that make such an indelible imprint upon students. Many of them are children and grandchildren. And we have many that are homeschooling and we have many that uh, go to uh, classical schools and private schools and Christian schools and public schools. But God uses all of those educational methods to be able to connect in very educationally, developmentally important times in the lives of each and every one of us. And we can all look back and see teachers, this litany of teachers that made a difference in our life. I'm married to an absolutely amazing teacher, so I praise God for teachers. I've been the recipient of, of great teachers. I, I can count on both of my hands teachers that never once, in the public school environment that I grew up in, they never once uh, led in prayer before class started. They never once brought a Bible to school and opened it up and preached to me. They never once bought these uh, kind of contraband gospel tracts and clandestine, you know, passed them out under the tables. None of that. But they modeled character and integrity they cared for their students. They were amazing teachers that loved what they were teaching, and they made a difference in my life. So I stand before you because of the grace of God, but I stand before you because the Spirit of God used people like Terry Dent and Wendy Clemens and Hank Beasley and Miss Staten. Miss Staten was my second grade teacher. The, school, the newspaper called me before I was in the midst of school. It wasn't before school. It was in the middle of my second grade year. And they asked me a question, who is your hero? And I, without any hesitation, said, Miss Staten. That was my second grade teacher. And I remember getting the paper from my mom the next day. And there I am, a little picture of me, a little blurb about my hero. And everybody else, their heroes were, were people you hang up in your, like the posters. Or Michael Jordan was on there. Jose Cansego, uh, Oakland A's, kind of one of the Bash brothers was on there. They were some of the guys from the New Kids on the Block. They made their way there. <laughs> and there I was saying, Miss Staten. But it, she, she was the kindest lady. I talked my way through elementary school. Surprise, surprise. I was the kid in kindergarten and first grade who got off the bus and I had pinned to my uh, shirt a note from my mom. Once again, I cannot get David to quit talking. I moved him here. I moved him here. I moved him here. So if your teachers know that your problem kid is one day going to become the pastor at Dawson right here. So... <laughs> But by the time I met Miss Staten, she just had all types of patience and kindness and gentleness. I could not articulate this, but she was exuding the fruit of the Spirit, and it made a difference in my life. Fast forward to eighth grade, not a Christian. My God is sports, relationships, Greg Stegall. 
Greg Stegall is my social studies teacher. He's my eighth grade football coach. I'm playing for him, and he motivates in a way that no other coach had motivated. He was intense, encouraging, but he did it with sort of respect and dignity. There's something different about him. I, I knew that from the very moment I met him. He was so relational, and he, would, he would got to know me and the rest of my uh, guy group right there, and he invested in us, and he was just an amazing, infectious teacher. Fast forward a few months into the school year, he said, David, I want you to come to FCA. I have no idea what FCA is. Coach, what's FCA? He says, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I still vividly remember going into that old, musty-smelling middle school gym. I can still hear the sound of the rickety stands as we stood on them and sat down on them and the smells that are just like the smells of decades of sweat in a junior high gym. But what is more indelibly imprinted upon me is this hero of mine. In this context of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, opening up the Bible to Luke chapter 12, telling the story of the parable of the rich man who had everything the world could offer, but it wasn't enough. He didn't call my name. There were hundreds of us there, but he was talking to me. And God used Coach Stegall, and he used other teachers. He used my peers around me who, who never stood up and preached to me with their Bible, but there was something different about them, and it was in the course of those events without me ever really walking into a church that I began to see that there was something that I needed in my life, and I could not articulate what that was, and it was under the providence of God that he drew me to a church that I could walk to from my junior high, and these things came together as only God can do in a divine appointment to call me from blindness to sight. From darkness to light. And I became a Christian because of the Spirit of God drawing me to Him. But the Spirit of God used my classmates and teachers and a coach to plant seeds that He brought to life. And so this week, thousands of students will go into classrooms that are taught by hundreds upon hundreds of Christian teachers who are called to be salt and light. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the entire house, all in the house, in the same way. Verse 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and pat you on the back. No, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus is the greatest teacher ever. One thing about compelling teachers is that they're clear accessible. Jesus draws upon some of the clearest images and metaphors that would have been available to all who heard them, just as evident as the sky, just as evident as the stars, just as evident as the dirt and the grass. So Jesus draws upon two images, salt and light, to be able to, to give us compelling directions of how we are to live as Christians in our communities, in our neighborhoods, our homes, our workplaces, our schools. You are a Christian, and you as a Christian are called to be salt of the earth. We could talk about both of these images. I want to talk just about the image and metaphor of salt today. What, what are the purposes and effects of salt upon you? I mean, think about this. Salt always, it always produces a thirst. I mean, think about this. If you go to the movies this afternoon, you get a big bucket of large popcorn, and it's salty, and you, you know that there's a reason you can be up 
charged to get a 40-ounce drink because what? The salt that you're consuming, it has this effect that draws you to something that needs to satiate the, the thirst that you have. So salt produces a thirst. Yesterday, you slept in, you went to brunch, you had a salty brunch. The whole day, you're trying to flush out that salt. It, it has this effect upon you that it draws you to, to try to quench your thirst. Think about how salt, 2,000 years ago, had this effect long before Maytag and Whirlpool, before you could go into your garage and have this meat that you, that you store in this deep freeze here. What was the purpose of salt? Well, it was a purifying purpose, a preservative. Many of you know what it's like to do this. You rub salt into meat to draw out the moisture in that meat to do what? To eliminate an environment that was hospitable for the growth of bacteria right there. So there's a purifying effect of salt. So it, it, it draws out a person to, to be thirsty. It has a purifying preservative effect But more than that, salt has a seasoning effect. I mean, this is probably what is most familiar to us. I mean, if you are a cook in this sanctuary this morning, salt is probably going to be very close to you. Not to overpower what you're cooking, but to enhance the flavor. To draw out the natural taste of what you're cooking right there. And so Jesus utilizes this image here that is so common, salt, but what part of this metaphor intersects with us as Christians. Well, what if all three of them do? I mean, think about the, that salt creates a thirst in us. And when you as a Christian go into your school, when you go into your workplace, when you as a Christian go into your neighborhood and you live a life that is distinct, not through your doing, but through the power of the Spirit of God in you and the fruit of the Spirit, like peace in conflicted situations, Loving people that are hard to love, being gentle when, when the natural response is to be haughty or to, to, to come hard, to, to be able to be joy-filled in the midst of difficulty here. When you do that in your workplace, when the Spirit of God shines forth in your school, you know what? Those that are around you, they begin to thirst They begin to say, hey, what is different about that person here? Where where can I get what they have? Because I don't have that. I knew what that was like when I was an eighth grader. And if you're a Christian here today, God has used people in your life that have had that kind of effect upon you. Maybe they're moms and dads. Maybe they're brothers and sisters, co-workers, teachers, directors, coaches, pastors, youth ministers, there's something about getting close to them in proximity to them that you begin to see something distinctive about their life. Jesus, he had this effect upon people. He comes high noon to a well. There's a Samaritan woman there who has a litany of mistakes that have followed her to that well. She comes to get water that is physical water. And Jesus says, hey, I want to introduce you to a source of water that if you drink of this source, you'll never thirst again. Here's the story. Everyone, he says in verse 13 of John 4, who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. He's pointing to the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Your friends and co-workers, maybe family members, maybe you sitting in the pew right here know what it is to, to long to long to be able to drink from from water that will be able to to satisfy you and to complete you. And and, and you're looking for that satisfaction. You're looking for that completion and the the ocean of what the world offers. And and the world is offering to you like like salt water that, that you drink of it and you drink of it and it just doesn't satisfy. It makes you more thirsty. So, so many people in our world are drinking from the ocean that will not quench their spiritual thirst. And they drink from the water of pleasure, but it's not enough. They drink from the water of success and achievement, but it is not enough. They drink from the water of their next purchase or next relationship or their next trip. And guess what? They come back again because it never delivers what it promises. 
but there's one. There is one who offers a living water, a water that if we drink from the well of Christ, it's inexhaustible. It is one that will quench our deepest desires and quench our deepest thirst. Centuries ago, the famous bishop of North Hippo, North Africa there in Hippo, St. Augustine, in what was the first autobiography. Augustine, in what we know as confessions, he, he pointed this out. He says, you, God, have made us for yourself. And our heart, hear this, our heart is restless until it rests in you. Your friends and your family members, your co-workers, maybe you know what it is to, to look for satisfaction and look for completion in uh, the ocean of the world. But what Augustine says is, is based upon what Jesus is saying here, that we will not find rest until we rest in him. Jim Carrey, the great comedian and actor, a few years back was in a Netflix documentary called Becoming Andy. He just played Andy Kaufman, the comedian, the strange and unique comedian that was always in, uh, inhabiting these characters. And Carrie, as an actor, inhabits Andy Kaufman, and he's reflecting upon this method acting that he does, and he's just staring. It's a very intimate portrait. And Carrie, at the height of success, the height of achievement, he's looking at the camera, and someone says he's looking at you, and he says this, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see it is not the answer. Christian, you are in your workplace. Christian, you're in your school. Christian, you are in your neighborhood, not accidentally, but by the very providence of God to be able to point people to the one who could satisfy our deepest desires, our deepest needs. And God has placed you there as salt and light. And we are called to live this out. And as we live this out, it has a purifying and preservative effect. We live in a sin-stained world. You don't have to go looking for examples of this. It's all around us because it's, it's inside of us. Not one of us, no matter our zip code, have a zip code that is the Garden of Eden. Not one of us, no matter how great of a workplace environment that you and others try to make, no matter how great HR is in your company, guess what? You cannot regulate sin out of your company because you can't regulate it out of your heart. We are stained and we're infected by sin and the results of sin. And that, that hits us in every aspect of our life. But God has placed Christians in this world, not accidentally, but through the providence of his plan. He has placed you in your workplace. He's placed you in your school to have a purifying, preservative effect. So through the common grace of God, you leave encounters, the divine appointments that he has. The, the rubbing of shoulders with your co-workers, the rubbing of shoulders with your peers, none of this is accidental, but God has placed you there so that you can point people to Christ through not just your words, but through your actions. When you exude and exhibit the Spirit of God, will, will any of us in this room as neighbors, will any of us in this room as, as employees or employers or as students or teachers, will any of us do this perfectly? The answer is no. But are we called to live this out? The answer is yes. And when we do this, it makes a difference in the conversations we have. It makes a difference because you have a, you have a mantle and a mantra that, that follows you and goes before you as a Christian. In your workplace, no matter who you work for, in your school, no matter who your principal is or who your teacher is, you have a calling. The Apostle Paul tells us clearly that whatever we do in word or deed, do it to the glory of God. And when you live a life of character and integrity, and when you pursue excellence, understanding that the reason that you're in this job isn't just paycheck to paycheck, but it's because God has a larger purpose for such a time as this. And you're rubbing up against the shoulders of others, and who knows the effect over time that your witness can have on a boss, a coworker, a teacher, Someone else in your class, you're not in that Spanish class accidentally. 
You didn't get assigned that teacher coincidentally, but it is the very providence of God that has placed you where you are in this season to make a difference so that you leave these opportunities with the imprint of the Spirit of God going in and before you and around you to point people not to you, but to Him. Years ago, I was pastoring a church, and we had this summer men's retreat. And we always capped it off by going down the Ekoe, the full uh, top and the bottom. If you've ever gone, it's about an eight-hour commitment. We're going whitewater rafting. There's about 45 of us. We get off the bus. They begin to assign us eight apiece. Our whole church is getting on this bus, I mean, getting on this boat, and then the next eight get on this boat, the next eight get on this boat, and me and a friend of mine, we're standing by each other, and we happen to be the last two, and we're assigned to a boat. There's a boat of young 20-year-old guys who I realized really quickly, uh, one of their friends is getting married next weekend, so these are a bunch of groomsmen, and this, has been, this is their bachelor party weekend, and needless to say, they were enjoying themselves. No pun intended, but this was an eight-hour really salty boat ride here. One of the groomsmen was supposed to be on that boat. There's supposed to be seven of them, just one of us were supposed to fill in. But one of them, because the night was uh, pretty, pretty uh, hectic and uh, they enjoyed themselves to the point that one of the groomsmen was arrested. And so instead of them canceling their boat ride, they left him in jail and the whole hours they're talking about going to bail him out. So I told my friend, I said, hey, uh, if, you, if it's okay, I'm, I'm going to sort of be like uh, Bruce Wayne. Don't, don't tell them that I'm actually a Baptist preacher here. So, I mean, this, this, hold that back for a second. And, and so we got on the boat and we went down and, and they were having a good time talking about this and that. And it was just, again, as I said, a real salty boat ride. We're seven hours into this trip. And at the end of the Ekoe, you go through it and you have about 45 minutes. It's a little bit more calm at the end of the trip. And one of the guys looked at me and we had talked small talk. I mean, we talked college football. We had talked baseball, those kinds of things. And so we had a little bit of things. And he looked at me and he said, hey, David, what do you do professionally? And so I was like, a, uh, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> that boat got really, I mean, you could hear them audibly gasping in that moment right there. For the next 45 minutes, that was the holiest boat that had ever come down the Ekoe. I mean, it just turned like this. Immediately, these guys, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm real active in my church right here. I was baptized at this age. And, you know, the other guy was like, oh, yeah. I was. And so I was just listening to them. And they were talking. And all of them had intersected the church, or many of them had intersected the church in a variety of ways. But it was real interesting to me. I wanted to sort of be incognito here. But in that moment, when they knew that I was a pastor, one of the guys actually said, hey, he's getting married. And would you pray for him? And his wife to be, as I'm about, like sort of sheepish and shy. And as soon as they realized, well, we've got somebody that maybe, I mean, he does weddings, and I mean, I guess he could pray for this person. I was like, well, sure. And it's just a reminder that eight and eight and eight, it wasn't an accident that I was in that boat. I was supposed to be in that boat. And there are hundreds of you that are going to go out to eat from Dawson. And you're going, to, you're going to populate all these restaurants. And you're going to have a waiter or a waitress that waits on you. And it's not happenstance. It very well may be that the witness of God in you, the peace and patience that you show, is just what she or what he needs. And tomorrow when you're waiting in a line to get your dry cleaning and you come to pay for it and you, you see that person, you have the opportunity right there to, to be an ambassador of the Holy Spirit to show kindness and love and peace. And we can multiply these examples a hundredfold. Each day we have the opportunity to be the salt of the earth, to have a purifying effect. Now, does this mean we're perfect? No. 
But does it mean that we're ambassadors and the Spirit of God lives in us and goes before us, is intended to draw people to Him? The answer is yes. But to do that, we see in this passage, there there must be purity and there must be proximity about each and every one of us because to be the salt of the earth, there must be purity in our life. Notice that Jesus says, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Oftentimes we sort of skip over this and get to the clearer, the light, don't hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. And we don't think about, in that context 2,000 years ago, people didn't go to the grocery store and get Morton salt and bring it home. The salt was harvested in salt marshes and the Dead Sea, and there were all kinds of impurity. There was dirt around it. There's moisture that could get in. Some of you have have been to the beach lately, and you know what it is to eat outside and the humidity and and to be able to to get a salt shaker and to to try to dump it out right there. And the moisture has infected the salt, and it's clumped together. And what do you do in that moment? You got to throw it out. You know what Satan's strategy is for us to be ineffective in our witness is for us to be impure witnesses. That when people see us, they don't see anything distinct about us. They don't see the ways of the word of God. They don't see the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and the gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. They see the same questions that they have all the same struggles that they have without any of the answers. Will I, will you be perfect representatives of Jesus? No. That's why we need a Savior. But are we called to be men and women who live lives that pursue holiness in light of being pursued by the grace of God? The answer is yes. So we confess our sin regularly. And he forgives us and he cleanses us of all unrighteousness. So maybe there's some of you that are stopped up salt shakers this morning. Maybe the first response to this message is to go home, to make an inventory of those ways that the world has seeped into your container and to pray and to receive that cleansing and that forgiveness. But we don't just need purity, we need proximity. I mean, think about salt shakers. I mean, the good of salt isn't to be huddled together on the table here, a bunch of salt shakers. No, the good of salt is to be tipped over and to be poured out. As Christians, we're not called to be salt containers and holy huddles that all gather together on Sunday to, to, to just remain together in holy huddles. No, our calling on Sunday is to worship the risen Lord and Savior, to be empowered by His Spirit, to go back into our neighborhoods, to go back into our communities and schools and workplaces, and to be poured out to the Spirit of God to make a difference for Him. I heard a story years ago of a man, customer, who walked into what's almost like non-existent, one of these little mom and pop grocery stores. You remember, you could just buy almost anything in those places. Curious customer. He asked the longtime owner of this store, hey, do you sell salt here? He he got really infectious, big smile on his face. Do we sell salt? You have come to the right place. Just look behind me right here. And there was this entire wall of shelves behind him with nothing but salt. Morton salt, iodized salt, kosher salt, sea salt, rock salt, garlic salt, seasoning salt, every kind of salt imaginable he had right there. The, The customer was impressed. But the owner said, hey, you hadn't seen anything. You hadn't seen anything yet. Waved him on. They go into the back room, big inventory room right there. And from the top of the ceiling to the bottom floor right here, he's got a back room of shelves of this inventory. There are bins and there are cartons and there are barrels and there are boxes of salt. Do we sell salt? And I mean, look at this. We sell salt here. Unbelievable, the customer said. And the owner, he, he, he stopped him again. He said, you think that's something? He waved him from that back room. They went down a long flight of stairs into a basement. And in the basement there, they come down it and the, the previous room paled in comparison. Their inventory room paled in comparison to this basement, five times larger, full, 
floor to ceiling with every imaginable form, size, shape of salt supplies. Any any of you grew up in the country, you remember those salt licks, 10-pound salt licks that you'd bring into the cow pasture? I mean, he had a whole corner full of these. The customer said, absolutely incredible. You really do sell salt. And the owner said, no, 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 no. That's just the problem. We don't sell near enough of it. But I tell you, oh boy, that salt salesman, he sells a whole lot of salt. (laughs) Church. Salt that stays on the shelf is no good at all. A stockpile of salt that is sitting on the shelves that we call pews, huddled into holy corners, is no good at all. We are called to be poured out by our Maker and our Savior in our communities, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our world. This is God's plan A for the spread of the gospel, for us to have a purifying effect through his Spirit, a a seasoning effect through his spirit so that people may drink from the living water of Jesus himself and never thirst again. Don't forget it, Christian, you are the salt of the earth.